Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Business and People podcast. This is the show when we take business and then we take the people behind the business and we talk about their stories and their background. Today on the show, we have a worldwide traveler, someone who describes himself as a digital nomad. In fact, one of the first entries I found for this person was that he was a snowboard instructor. He's gone on to become a SaaS hacker a CTO and founder of a startup. He now travels the world 12 months of the year working from anywhere. And we talked before we hit record about his Airbnb bill and his, of course, Uber bill and Lyft and how that compares to the traditional, uh, I guess, stay at home or office expenses that we might face. We're going to talk to you about all of those things. Welcome to the show, Mr. Stephen Vanderpel. Thank you so much for having me, Walt. I'm super excited to be here. It's great to have you with us, man. Now, you have uh, an amazing lifestyle that so many people in this digital age really find fascination with. And, and I love the fact that you call yourself a digital nomad. How do, you, how do you work in a way that keeps you traveling so often? So obviously all the work that happens online. Uh, so basically all that I need is a computer and a good stable internet connection. And today it's, it's just super easy to get there. Like there's so many countries where people think, oh, well, that's so backwards. They won't have the, the utilities that I need. It's like, it's false. And 99% of all cases, like I've been living in Colombia and Thailand and Vietnam, um, Chile, Argentina, like so many uh, uh, countries and the internet's always really good. Wow, there's a few exceptions, but, you know, and generally the internet is there and I can just work from, from any place, which is, well, incredible. Fantastic. So graduated out of Griffith into, yes. the, into the tech space. How did you go? How did you get into that space and why did that kind of appeal to you? So actually my, my story kind of uh, begins a little bit earlier than Griffith, uh, Griffith University in, in Brisbane, of course, where I did one and a half yards for my master's. But I already got into programming quite early, like, 13, 14 years old. And I was obviously doing that, like your side gigs when you are that age, like the, your paper rounds and stuff like that, right? And back then it was still guilders, no euros still. But, you know, they would pay you four, three, four, five guilders per hour or something like that. And um, I was working at this place called Neckerman, which is like a catalog kind of shop. And, uh, you know, <laughs> this goes a little bit to an, in, in the gray illegal area. So, <laughs> bear with me um so i was young right and we were working at, at order picking at this necromon thing and we actually got our hands on some cell phones <laughs> not completely illegal um but you know i had a cell phone i was very young and i didn't have any money for credit or whatever it was which was really expensive back then so i started playing with this phone right like connecting it with a cable to the computer and seeing what whatever the fuck I could do with that particular phone is like, you know, editing the menus and uh, adding uh, games or stuff like that. And um, I found this thing that was called SIM unlocking, mobile phone unlocking. And this was like one app and one big ass button. Like it was, that was it. It's like just that unlock, hit the button, boom. You saw some log going on and like the phone was unlocked. I'm like, Okay, whatever, right? And then I started doing some more research online and I saw that people were asking like 15 Dutch guilders, like let's say $15 uh, to do that. And it took me like five seconds to do this. And I was like, hmm, <laughs> wait, I can earn $15 for each phone, which takes me like five seconds to do instead of like $4 for a whole hour of like not hard labor, but not, you know, it's, it's still quite intensive, like doing your paper rounds. So I was like, fuck, I'm going to do this. I'm going to like get people to come over and like do this unlocking thing. So that's where I kind of started uh, like an unlocking business. So like in my little town and starting some, uh, doing some extra money there. And I think it took like two, three years and then something new came on around the market was called remote unlocking where um, like, Providers would offer software to unlock shops. That was becoming a thing back then as well. Uh, to like remote unlock easier. It's like they didn't have to have all this special hardware and stuff like that. And I kind of came up with this idea where I thought like, well, let's cut out the middleman. Why do people still need to go to the shop? Let's make this software user friendly and then just sell it directly to the users. And I think I was the first one in the world to actually come up with that. And I had a friend who owned one of these softwares. And I told him like, hey, let me design your interface and uh, I'll create an online system for it. 
and let's just start selling it and see how it does. And within months, um, like this was on his account, he was doing like 30, 40 K a month. Right. I'm like, fuck. <laughs> like I was making good money with that as well because I got like, yeah, it's like an affiliate commission almost. Uh, but I was like, I want to own that. Right. It's like, that's amazing. And then I started looking for solutions and for programmers that can actually do the hacking and found it like a Samsung Unlock uh, server together with another Dutch guy who did all that, that actual hacking on the phones, on the Samsung phones and made the, the software. I was just taking care of all the online stuff, the, the shop stuff, the fulfillment, etc. So yeah, that, that grew into the biggest Samsung Unlock server in the world. And I ran that for like 10 years. And that, that was the reason I actually got to go to Australia. Like I was quite bored in the Netherlands and I wanted to travel. I had the money to do whatever I wanted. And I was looking for, um, for, for um, what's that called? Um, you know, just um, experiences and, and challenges, right? Mm. And uh, so I was like, let's get the F out of here as far as away as possible. And I ended up in Australia uh, doing get a master. Right. Like, that's that's yeah. as far as you can go. <laughs> exactly exactly so yeah like with that money i could of course pay for these uh, universities i also managed to get like a scholarship for um you know getting out of the netherlands kind of thing but that was pure luck actually so but yeah like just traveling to your to the australia um and getting to know the country was easy because i had the savings and i had the money there so i didn't have to worry about anything like that that's very cool that's super cool so is that where the travel bug started for you Stephen? like did you that that initial trip to Australia was that kind of the the first bite of the the need for more passport stamps? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like, so my parents were uh, are quite the travelers. Like, they had like this camper van, and we traveled through Europe. You know, uh, me as a young boy with them and with my brother even as well. Uh, but yeah, like Australia was my first time in an airplane and my first big flight as well. I remember it was like a 35 hour flight. Like we had some delays in between, it was horrible. And yeah, I was nervous as, as fuck when I got there. Like everything was arranged online and like the housing and everything, like university, completely different. Uh, English wasn't bad, but still it's, it's still different. You know, uh, Australian English isn't the easiest one to understand from the first time either. So yeah, it was it was quite an adventure, but yeah, it was the, one of the most amazing times of my life, and, and wow. it definitely started a buck. I basically never stopped traveling after Australia. So that's so cool. So how many countries have you been to now? Uh, I've no idea. Well, there's like I think there's is it 270 countries in the world. Uh, yeah, I have one friend who only misses a few of them, uh, <laughs> but I think me personally maybe 50 60 70 something like around that i've never really counted to be honest have you ever thought about ticking off the list in terms of where have i not been and and uh, going to there or do you have like a favorite set of 10 countries and you just keep going through those ones that's kind of what happened yeah so i did at some point thought like oh no it would be really cool you know on your facebook like i think there were even apps like showing where you've been and at some point i have started filling those out but i can be fucked like keeping up with that yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> and yeah in the last five years six years uh, i joined this community it's called the dynamite circle uh, it sounds a bit weird but it's it's quite amazing it's all with entrepreneurs that are location independent so there's kind of a difference between digital nomads and location in, independence uh, digital nomads is also just people that work remotely right mm -hmm. they, they travel and just work remotely they're not business owners location independent business owners that's kind of a different thing and this community is only with people that have their own businesses that do at least six figures but there's plenty of doing seven and even eight figure there as well and they they organize a lot of things like uh, conferences meetups local meetups wow. and there's these there's these hops in all over the world that are these cities that are particularly popular with this group of people and uh yeah this because this, you know, you, you're the average of the five people uh, that you spend most time with, right? I'm a strong believer of that. And so I love hanging out with these, these, these people because they're all extremely smart and extremely agile, uh, big minds, like they travel the world. So they have this, this different points of views, appreciation for culture, stuff like that. And I just love hanging out with them. So what kind of happens is you get in this in this kind of round race, right? Like around the world, just following the summer a lot of the times or sometimes going for snowboarding in the winter. Uh, but yeah, you follow these, these hops. So like Medellin is a big ass hop, uh, Chiang Mai, Bangkok, Austin, 
Barcelona, um, uh, capital of uh, Portugal, Lisbon. Mm -hmm. uh, Berlin has been as well. Budapest, um, Saigon, Ho Chi Minh City. Um, yeah, all these kinds of cities, they, they always have like a good group of, of these people that you can just connect with instantly. And it's, it's both of a safety, uh, a mental nice thing as well, and, and just an, an anti-loneliness, right? Like so, us entrepreneurs, like we deal with a lot of loneliness, mm. especially when you're traveling on your computer and to different cities and different countries all the time. So having that community behind you is just... That's amazing. Street. Yeah, I, I find that absolutely amazing, and I, I had no idea that 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 kind of community existed. And I love the fact that they're putting the the conferences together, like the hubs, so that when you're traveling independently, you're still together as like part of that group. I, I find that amazing. So now you're you're uh, traveling by Airbnb, right? So like everywhere you're going, you've got the Airbnb for X number of months or however you want to set it up. So I know you, you're in a, a nice Airbnb right now. Do you uh, do you typically book like for a period of time, do you say, okay, I'm going to be here for a month or I'm going to be here for like three months? Do you, do you set that in place before you book? Yeah, yeah, generally I do. Um, so there are some exceptions, like for example, Chiang Mai, which uh, often is actually better when you just get there, do an Airbnb for a few days and then go around on a scooter and then uh, ring on doors, basically like big ass buildings and then you get better prices. Uh, but generally just for ease of mind as well, I do it in advance. And the more in advance you do it, um, the better is it, it, your options, right? The, the, the more options you'll have. And I always do trying to like negotiate a little bit so I don't just take the prices head on. Uh, but like I contact them, and I tell them a little bit about me. I'm like, hey, I work online, so stable, fast internet is crucial. Uh, what's your internet connection? Can you do me a screenshot of speedtest.net? Uh, and you know, you can start uh, negotiating. It's like, oh yeah, I really love your place, but there was this one other place, it's also really cool, but it's like, yeah, $500 cheaper, uh, but I like your place a little bit more because of this and this reason, so can you go down a little bit, and then I'll just take your place, and it basically always works, right? Especially oh, cool. when you go for longer periods of time, if you can save for, even a month is already, uh, you know, a lot of Airbnb owners like that, but if you can say two, three months or four months, oh, you, you can get bigger discounts for sure. Absolutely. And you can imagine why. So before we hit record, Stephen, you and I were talking about the, the expense of uh, traveling the world like that versus what I would say is the traditional, you know, uh, we've got a house and a car and whatever. And obviously it's, it's different with, with um, people who have families and, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. And that we understand that. But like, can we just share those numbers if you don't mind? Like, I, I found it absolutely fascinating. So you mentioned uh, a number that was your total accommodation and transport for the year uh, that's just passed. Do you mind sharing that? Sure. So yeah, I, I spent uh, 15,600 on all my Airbnbs and uh, you know, the Ubers, the lifts. Uh, that's basically how I get around uh, in the city. Is, is that in yes. a 12 month period? That's 12 month period. Yeah. Wow. That's incredible. So, and, like, it's, it's between $800 and $1,500 a month for, an, uh, for a decent Airbnb. I always have uh, one bedroom or two bedrooms. So I don't do studios or anything like that. That's amazing. So, I mean, I know Australia is an expensive country and a lot of our listeners are in the UK or in the US. And, and you know, those countries are expensive at, at the same time as well. But when we look at that, and, it's, and it works out average roughly, you know, 300 bucks a week, roughly. And that covers all of your accommodation and all of your transport. So you don't have, you don't have a car. You're literally just yep. having that, um, you know, Uber or Lyft or whatever it is at the time. Um, and you don't have uh, the expense of, of a fixed permanent address. You're literally going from that Airbnb to Airbnb. I, I find that fascinating. Again, like to compare numbers is just ridiculous because, you know, we have, have the house here and all that kind of stuff. But I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm shocked by how much it costs, how little it costs to be able to travel to these amazing places in the world and connect with amazing business owners and keep the costs as low as they are. I think and listen, listen, I haven't even told you the best thing. Oh, no, I don't. <laughs> so last year I spent uh, eight months almost in Mexico City, for example. How often do you think I've, uh, I've, I've wasted or spent my time, however you want to see it, going to, for example, the supermarket? I, I can't imagine. Um, once a week, once a, once a few. Every Less week. than one hour in eight months. What? How is that possible? There's like every, a lot of the places where I go to uh, have these apps. Like uh, here specifically in Latin America, it's called Rappi. 
uh, and in Asia that's called something Gojek. And you just do all your uh, all your uh, buys from your phone or from your computer, and they bring it to your house. Wow! And I pay ninety, like for example here, I pay ninety nine pesos, which is about five US dollars per month, and I don't pay any shipping cost. And they like even for the smallest order, they just bring it right up to your uh, door. And you wow. don't have to waste any time shopping. Same thing, cleaning. I don't do that. Yeah, of course, it's all part of the Airbnb. Thing. It's it's such a waste of your time. Wow. Cleaning is such a waste of your time. Like, and as an entrepreneur, you need to be effective and, and productive with your time, right? Like, it really matters if you do the math for over a whole year. Mm. Like, that, that, what, that 30 minutes a day or that, you know, three yeah. hours a week or whatever it is that you spend on cleaning. If you do the math for a whole year, that's a lot of extra time you could be uh, spending on your business or relaxing, right? Because relaxing is just as important as spending time on your business because mm. that makes you you and that makes you be able to perform when you need it on your business. Wow. Uh, so yeah, I, I oh, never no. clean. Like cleaning wow. ladies are so cool. cheap and, and often included in Airbnbs as well. So yeah. That's amazing. So what's, a day, what's an average day look like for you now? So, before, so, I, before I get there, you're, you're, you're a co-founder of a, of a tech startup, which is Kaivio, kaivio.com. We'll make sure the, the, the link's there as well. You're a co-founder. What is your average day now in this traveling business world? So basically, I always work at home. So a lot of, there's quite a bit of my friends. There's always like a, a kind of, a, eh, maybe it's a 50-50. I'm not 100% sure. But, you know, a lot of my friends have the same lifestyle. They, uh, they work at co-working spaces or even cafes. I don't like that personally. I'm just too distracted of those. I, I want to work at home. That's why I also pay a little bit more for Airbnb because you can actually do that a lot cheaper than I'm doing. But I want to have like a nice space around me. Like I don't want the small places because I work at home. I spend a lot of freaking time at home behind my computer. So basically I wake up. Um, I don't do mornings. Uh, so I'm a late night person. Uh, I wake up around 1 p.m. Yeah, <laughs> for real. <laughs> And within, you know, five to 10 minutes, I'm behind my computer working. Uh, then uh, around 8 p.m., I call uh, for food. Uh, sometimes I'll go out, of course, with friends. But in a normal day, if I don't go out, again, it's rappy. I just get something healthy because there's a, a multitude of, of healthy restaurants around. And I just get some healthy food, relax for an hour, have dinner, uh, continue working till like 2, 3 a.m., and then relax a little bit again. Just I can't go to sleep directly from work. I need to like do something stupid, like mindless, like watch some TV. And then, you know, uh, day starts over again. Wow, cool. And is that five days, six days, seven days a week? It uh, depends very much, right? So like um, I don't really care about the weekend. Like uh, it's meaningless. Like I can go out on a Monday and a Tuesday just as well as a Friday and a Saturday. Yeah. I don't care about that at all. Uh, but yeah, like I come like, for example, Mexico is an absolutely beautiful country. There's so much to see here. And yeah, I, I go out like uh, actually this Saturday, I'm going to go hike up a mountain where, where there's snow at the moment. While here in Mexico City right now, it's like uh, 28, 26 degrees Celsius. Mm -hmm. uh, I have no idea how much that is in Fahrenheit. About 80, I never I guess. Afraid, but... <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Good. It's, it's, uh, warm, but yeah. it's warm. It's warm. It's warm and nice. And like two hours south of here, uh, we're, we're going to hike a mountain and there's going to be snow. And wow. like just two days ago, I was uh, at Playa del Carmen, which is very close to Cancun. Cancun is pretty known to a lot of people. Playa del Carmen's next to that. And Bacalar, which is another small town, is even next to that. And they're super idyllic. I mean, seriously, like they're so Instagrammable. Like there's like seven different colors of, of, of ocean there, like different shades of blue. Uh, it's beautiful. And uh, it's just, it's, it's lively. The people are amazing. The food is amazing. A lot of fish food, of course. It's like right at the sea. Um, yeah, it's, that, that's, that's also live there. And you can work there. There's, there's internet there as well, right? So it's, yeah, it's pretty good. That's amazing. So, so weekends don't mean much, but you know, it is a fairly uh, hectic work schedule and then obviously interrupted by beautiful places or experiences and things to do. Now, I know, um, so digging in a little bit, let, let's talk about Kaivio and let's talk about getting that set up and, and how that's all come together. Um, I know your co-founder, Neil, very well, um, but you guys have had a rocky few years. Like it's been, it hasn't just been, hey, this is a great idea, let's take it to market. You guys have had a, a, a rough a rough turn. So let's and now obviously everything's coming great with how everything's working out. And, and uh, that's really, really cool. But take me back to the start. How did you guys get together and, and come up with this idea? 
<laughs> that's a funny story actually um so me and neil we met uh, online first uh like so i i already i came from the sim unlocking uh stuff and i was like i'm a programmer i can do this and then i started the warrior forum stuff and i like making uh, people doing launches like two three four five six hundred thousand in, in a week time i'm like that's what i want that sounds awesome right like that's a perfect start for a bootstrap SaaS company and that's kind of what I wanted to do. So I tried to do that by myself and I failed miserably. Like I just didn't understand the marketing angle and even less so the, the human angle, right? The networking angle, the affiliates and how all that kind of worked. And during that time, Neil took notice of me trying and failing. And we kind of got start talking and he helped me out with, uh, with the first product that was back then called affiliate skin it was still it was a good idea but like the execution on the marketing angle and the affiliate angle was horrible uh, but yeah like i made a few thousand dollars on that because of neil he did some webinars with me and uh, you know just back and forth in, in the months following i helped him with some technical stuff and he helped me with marketing stuff and then at some point we actually met up at a jv zoo event in orlando and uh, the talks itself were <laughs> not that amazing. And we kind of got bored with a group of uh, guys, Wilco the Cry, I'm sure you know him as well, Abby, uh, Lester, uh, Neil, me. And uh, we just, I don't remember who said it, but somebody bloated out like, let's jump out of an airplane. And yeah, we all like guys were like, nobody wants to take an out of, of course. So like, that's what we did. We jumped out of an airplane. And at the moment that you're sitting there, just like waiting for, uh, to get in that small airplane, you know, all together, uh, I was talking with Neil is like to keep our minds off what the fuck, what we were about to go and do. Right. <laughs> it's like, you really don't want to like think too much about that because you get more and more nervous and more and more sweaty. So we were just talking about business and, and kind of how he saw the, the, the next few years coming uh, to happen for his business and what I wanted to do. And we kind of uh, noticed that. Ooh, I, and what I, you wanted to do. I lost you, mate. I said, I heard you say we kind of noticed and then I lost it. We're going to try and get Stephen back here. Stephen, uh, if you can hear me, bud, I lost you there for a second. I, I can hear you fine. Can you hear okay, me? I've got, I think I've got you back. I heard you say we kind of noticed and then it cut out. Ah, okay. Sorry. So yeah, I, we kind of noticed. Ooh, we've we've lost Stephen again. We keep losing you, bud. And damn it. we keep losing. I don't know you. what's happening. So I get, that's internet for you in some places. <laughs> <laughs> After we were just talking about how how we need the internet. Uh, so yeah, exactly. We kind of noticed. Yeah. So we kind of noticed that we had overlapping visions, and we decided to start something together. And we started building uh, early 2017, if I remember correctly, or maybe, yeah, 2017. And then uh, a big uh, opportunity came our way with uh, InstaSuite, mm -hmm. uh, which was a product from Suzanne, who sadly passed away. Uh, and that was one of the reasons that she reached out to us because she was sick at this moment. Uh, so we launched this and it did very well, right? This InstaSuite did like 400K in the first month. And so we kind of merged the InstaSuite ID with our, uh, like our initial vision, which was adaptively, which adaptive websites that, uh, that are adapt themselves based on what the customer wants and needs at that very moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we started building that. Uh, but I made a big mistake there. I didn't really check the code from InstaSuite well before we actually decided to purchase it. And it turned out it was pretty crappy. So we had to do a lot of extra work. Um, can you still hear me? Yeah, yeah, still got you, bro. Okay, yeah, I got a message my, that my internet wasn't stable, so that's why I was asking. Uh, but yeah, we, got a, we had to do a lot of work to get that stable. And uh, when I started digging in further and further, I had to come to the conclusion, like, if we really want to grow this as a big business, the current code, the current database model is just not going to work. No. So I had to make the decision to say like, okay, we have to start this from scratch, wow. like from absolute zero. And that was a really difficult uh, decision, obviously. So yeah, we started doing that in 2018, February. And um, yeah, that, that whole kind of um, 
action, tra like just doing that, starting it, uh, like making it like the best that we could ever do. Uh, we have extremely advanced DevOps, like our server setups, uh, stuff like that. It's pretty technical, but uh, we, we have, we've been built for extreme skill, basically. But it took so much more effort than I could have ever imagined. Like just wow. getting our server set up, like the infrastructure correct, took about eight months. Wow. Yeah, that was absolutely a horrible <laughs> uh, experience. And uh, yeah, just then the coding, uh, we got screwed over a few times by, by development, different developers even, um, if, like, a, like a dev shop in Pakistan where we hired one person. Uh, she did great in the interviews. And in the beginning, like the first few months, she did great codes. And then she's like, oh, I have some friends. Uh, it would be cool, like, uh, to get some extra help and we can work together here in this uh, particular co-working spot in Pakistan. And I'm like, yeah, that's actually a good idea. So I did the interviews, uh, interviews and everything worked out. Like, these were smart people and they were definitely, th they knew what they were doing. And again, first few months, uh, they did really good work. And then all of a sudden, it started going up and down a lot. And I was really confused. And uh, yeah, uh, skipping forward a little it turned that at point they were just uh, forcing their junior developers. It wasn't just individual people. It was actually a dev shop. They never told me this. And I never really uh, find out in modern time anyway. And they forced junior developers to work under their names. Wow. So each time, you know, their quality went down and I got mad. And I'm like, what the fuck's happening? And then they switched uh, them out again for this, uh, like the people we actually hired. Wow. And that went up and down and up and down. Like, and I started doubting myself so much. It's like, what am I doing wrong here? Where, like, am I such a bad manager that like the, the, there's no steady quality of their work? Like, mm -hmm. I know they can do it, but yeah, you know, one moment they do amazing, and then the other moment they they, they absolutely suck at what they're delivering. Wow. Yeah, and this this cost us months in, in the end. Like, we had to redo uh, not everything, but like quite a bit of code uh, that was written by you know those juniors at, at some point. So I know so, yeah, that, that sucked. That, that, that <laughs> sounds like a, a rocky road indeed. And, and I know that, that uh, Neil and yourself have stayed true to what you're trying to create in the marketplace. Um, were there ever times that you were both sitting down together with, I don't know, with a half a bottle of tequila left going, my God, what the hell did we just do? Like, was there ever a point that you kind of thought, like, this is too hard? Yes. Yeah, yeah. There are more than one point, um, to be honest. Like, like we've been working on this for quite a while and you know, there's a difference between deserving and earning uh, yep. money. But yep. uh, like we have had m various months that we weren't paying ourselves. Yeah, of course. Just, you know, like just to keep everything going. And uh, we've made some, um, Ah, I don't, I'm not sure if it's, I can say it's a bad decision, but we, we were trying to switch away from the affiliate model, like the launch model, to more an evergreen model, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, we've, we've tried that for multiple months at a time, and it just didn't work out. And that hurt our revenue, uh, like sources, right? So yeah, and that kind of got us into difficult positions financially, where we just had to say, okay, um, like for the next two, three months, we won't take anything out for ourselves. Uh, and we even have, I think this has happened only once, luckily, that we said to the team, all right, so we don't want to fire anybody. We really want to continue with, we had a good team at, the, at that moment, uh, and at this moment as well right now, but um, like, okay, we're going to have to cut hours to like drive down the budget and to make sure we can keep paying everybody because we don't want to get to this moment where we can pay uh, like some people or something like that right mm -hmm. so yeah that we had to do like we had to cut down people's hours it's like okay instead of working 160 hours a week uh sorry a month uh you're you're, you're going to be limited to 120 hours and uh, most people uh that start still in the team specifically they agreed with that they understood it uh, they know we are a bootstrap startup we're not some enterprise with a lot of uh outside funding or whatever um and you know the ones that weren't really into it that weren't really uh, following our vision of our company and what we're trying to create here, they left. And in the end, that's basically a filter, right? So that actually, in the end, is that's a good thing. And now we have a good team that's really dedicated and really pushing uh, to get, you know, those last um, dots on the eye, the last, um, in the Netherlands, we have this weird saying, uh, the last lets, you know, the let, the iron, weighs the heaviest. 
it's a very weird translation to English, I know, but uh, yeah, that's kind of what's happening right now. These last kind of steps are are so hard. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so you've got a big team now, like you, you've got a, a whole bunch of people that are behind you, and um, you've said a couple of times that that you're really, really, really pleased with how that team's kind of assembled. How do you keep that culture? How do you keep the vision? How do you keep that team working when you're all in different places in the world? So I think what, what's really important is that you get them to buy in of what you're trying to do. Mm. And that means, uh, so we have biweekly, uh, so like we, we work in sprints, like uh, sprints two weeks. And uh, for every sprint we have, uh, we do a team call. Uh, we, we make sure that all the cameras are on and that everybody can see each other a little bit. And we have like a specific um, agenda for those calls as the points that we go through. One of the points that we always go through uh, that me, myself or Neil leads at that moment is uh, going over our values and about what we're doing. And this is a lot of repetition, right? Yeah. And uh, like at, in the beginning, like I was like, this is boring as fuck for everybody. But it's actually really, really useful. Like you keep reminding them why they're doing it and what we're creating. Uh, and that just helps a lot. And uh, besides that, we have, of course, we have like our Slack. It's, we don't actually use Slack. We use called something Rocket Chat, uh, our own installation. We have our, we've built our own intranet um, as a software. We even thought about maybe launching that someday, but yeah, we haven't really done that. Um, so it's called Team Rack, and we have built in the chat into that. So we have all of our SOPs, all of our documentation, uh, all together with the with the, the Slack like chat system. And yeah, we're we're in touch. Everybody's in, in touch with each other every day, of course. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that's that's definitely a big thing. One thing we really really want to do, but we haven't had the budget for, is organize uh, company retreats. Yeah, so, so I have a lot of friends that have that have been raving about the changes that happen after a company retreat. So hopefully 2020 will be the first uh, one for us. That'd be cool. So yeah. you mentioned that the final steps are the heaviest and, and you're at the point now where it's it's getting to production and ready for, you know, mass market, et cetera. Um, what, are, what are some of the, the things that you are finding out now that you wish you knew a year ago? Not necessarily from a tech level, but just from a how things are playing out in the marketplace, how things are... Uh, playing out from in a business internal point of view, like what are you what what's coming to the front now that you think, wow, if we'd known that 12, 12 months ago, we would have been able to to move accordingly. Well, there's definitely a, a few technical um, bad decisions that I made mm -hmm. uh, that I thought like, oh, no, we really need to look at the future and look at like, oh, this particular framework or language. That's the, that's the one of the future. That's the one we should take. But I wasn't an expert in it myself. And that hurt us uh, because, you know, I should have chosen something that I really, really knew. Yeah. And that sometimes has hold us back because um, I can't check work that well because I don't know that particular framework that well. So those are definitely just, I think, even ego decisions that are like developers always want to work with the newest of the newest, right? Like I'm sure marketers have the same thing, like with the newest software, you know, yeah. but, you know, doing it simple and taking what you already know is a better start than going with something completely new and that's definitely uh, a, a big learning point and uh yeah at, at the other side for the marketing side like doing more calls like being more in person like there's like i have uh, like a fault in my character and neil has this as well but less than i do i think too complicated and all, all the things that I can cut in my brain and think that people need, it's all, it all always gets pretty complex, complex. and people don't like complex. <laughs> and it's often not necessary either. Uh, the, the simpler funnels often do work better. Uh, there's a little bit of a but there as well, especially these days because the, the, the traditional sales funnels, uh, they are less and less effective um, because people you know, they're, they're, what you had in the, in the beginning of the 2000s, like banner blindness, you now kind of get funnel blindness, specifically in the internet marketing market. Uh, and you have to be careful with those kind of things. Um, but yeah, in general, I, I would have wished that I would have talked more to people one-on-one -on -one, uh, to get really a good, a better view of what they need and want and how their processes and their companies work. So is that like, I, I know in a lot of circles, we call that the customer feedback circle. Is there something that, um, that you've put in place now to, 
to speed up that feedback? Yes, definitely. Um, like this is completely outside of my comfort zone, but I've been doing uh, sales calls, uh, which is not really focused on the sales, but more on the pitch slash dem demo. Yeah. And then getting uh, feedback from, from potential users. And it's, it's like you really like get to know yourself a little bit. Like one of the first calls I had, I was like, oh, this is the perfect guy for this. this like the smart journey is like the adaptive customer journey builder. And this is like, he's completely into this. He uses the same, same terminologies as the I am thinking in. And yeah, he would be perfect for this. And then I had this call and I was like, and he was like, yeah, it looks good, but yeah, way too complex, not for me. <laughs> right. Like, oh, interesting. <laughs> interesting. Interesting. So you've been able to hear that real feedback from customers. And then has that, has that in this last phase of getting, you know, product ready and market fit and all that kind of stuff, have you had to make big changes as a result or have you been trimming stuff back? No, not big changes. Uh, it's, it's mostly about the angles, like the marketing angle that Understood. we're, that we're still yeah. pivoting a little bit and seeing uh, what, what works better for people like so i was doing like oh no i'm gonna call it prospect uh customer uh, prospect journeys adaptive prospect journeys and like it's it's very uh correct the word it's very specific like that's exactly what we do like for me uh, there's a, a prospect journey which is up until the point you buy something and then your customer journey starts right that's what happens after they make a purchase when they're actually a customer however most people just call it customer journey from the beginning to the end. Yep. And that's not 100% correct in my point of view, but that's what people are using and that's what people are responding to. So that's what I need to adapt to, right? Like I need to start just calling that customer journeys and don't be so difficult. And no, but this part is prospect journey and that part is customer journey. So these are these things that I really need to focus on. And, and I was really like, oh yeah, I want to make it adaptive. So that's one of the biggest things that we're doing. Uh, and it's extremely powerful that, you make the customer journeys adaptive to each person. Uh, and that's really sexy. And that's kind of like, there's some other uh, like write message, uh, gist, get gist, uh, autopilot. These are these kind of companies that do the same and they do, they do very well. So there's definitely a good market for that. One of the feedbacks I got as well is like, well, you have to be careful with that uh, because I don't really care that much about the individual journeys, but mm -hmm. more on the segmenting. And that's when he's like, uh, like uh, this particular person, like he started like, well, that, that's really powerful. If you can make uh, like basically funnels where people filter themselves into the right segments and then create the, 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 the right sales funnels for each of those segments of your target audience, that's super powerful. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's a really great angle to go with, uh, with the same software that we already have, basically. So it makes it less complex because you zoom out a little bit yeah. and uh, the, the, the whole message, be, message becomes more clear. Have you got to a point where, and, and I'm just curious from a pure business journey and software development release journey, because as you know, I have the software background as well. Um, have you got to the point where you've closed off dev for a particular release date and you're now saying, okay, we'll do that in version two. Have you got to that yet? Um, yeah, there's a whole bunch of, of features and, and stuff that we, we have so many IDs that I have said to uh, like with, uh, like while, while discussing it with Neil, obviously, as like, yeah, this this is my ID and everybody I tell it to so like, Oh, that's an amazing, that sounds so interesting. But, uh, then I have to call myself back. It's like, no, this is my ID. I yeah. need to get rid of my IDs. Like we have a basis now and now I need to start like giving my IDs or pushing them into the software and just wait. Just like we have a good basic, uh, functionality of everything that we need for the adaptive journeys uh, and now i need to just wait and get input from actual users of what they want and how they start seeing the software and how start using the software as well right and yeah that's what we are basically uh, waiting for right now fantastic how many people in the team now 17 i think wow that's heavy are you um what's the what's the split from uh, like i remember looking through you've got uh, of that 17, obviously yourself and Neil, you, so you've got 15 others. It looked to me like you've got about four or five in marketing and the rest in dev. Is that, does that sound about right? Um, let me quickly check for you. Um, so for dev, if you, if you include QA and DevOps, yep. uh, we have just a quick count. One, two, three, uh, four, 
Same. Hang on, you're a programmer. You only go zero once and you're up to <laughs> uh, seven, eight. So eight uh, people for dev and then the rest is, uh, you know, support, uh, design, two designers. Uh, I think the support is three people and then uh, another two or three people specifically for marketing. Fantastic. And is that, um, is that enough, Stephen? Are you, do you have holes in the company right now that you're trying to fill or is that... The, is, is that the launch team? No, uh, we definitely have a bit of holes because uh, both me and Neil, we are, um, uh, I always forget this word in English. Um, uh, damn it. Um, like we are the point of where everything stops. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're the bottleneck. Bottleneck. That's the word I was looking for. Thanks. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're still bottlenecks and that's not good in a, in a, in a or company or like an organization, right? So actually uh, starting in January, what we did for the first time is we created a uh, accountability chart. So not an organizational chart, but an accountability chart where uh, everybody uh, is not per person, but it's per position and what they're accountable for. And then we were, we were going to, uh, we are filling those positions with people like who fits cool. where. Cool. So not first people, but first the, what's necessary, what the responsibilities are. And then we fill that in with people. And then uh, we look what, what places are still missing. And for example, one thing that we are missing right now is a technical project manager. Right. Like, uh, I am a technical project manager. I am a CTO. Um, um, I do reporting. Uh, I do planning. Uh, I do a lot of, uh, you know, uh, putting out fires, uh, uh, even some lead developer stuff, uh, because, you know, there's every now and then there's problems that the team is like, yeah, we tried it, but we can't see a solution that I need to step in as a developer even. And it's like, okay, the logic needs to go this way. And I'm also doing marketing and uh, strategical planning, right? So it's just way too much uh, at the moment. So yeah, we definitely have a few holes there. (laughs) But how do you go about recruiting? Is it um, uh, are you headhunting specific people that you know, or are you putting up ads and you know sort- sorting through responses? So yeah, we have. Uh, so I don't know if you know this, but we actually own jobrack.eu before. I knew that job. Know. Yeah. So yeah, we used to own that. We sold it to another DC here actually. Uh, this year is like a, a member of the, the, the Dynamite Circle community. Uh, so yeah, we still use that platform. Uh, we still use Upwork every now and then as well. But by because we had uh, job rec, we had a pretty good process and eight steps uh, for hiring. So it, we basically created a funnel for hiring and we still use that uh, same progress um, in, with that basically, like with the tests, with the, like, you know, uh, writing a proper job ad where it's really sexy, like you're selling yourself because that's what you need to do, right? Uh, and then like adding some small uh, chick tricks, like, you know, uh, repeat this word or whatever, that's just gets out of the first 80% or whatever, and then uh, make them do a test, uh, get them to an interview with a team member, uh, and then get them to do an interview with me or Neil, depending on their position. And then they get into um, an onboarding week. So um, we actually have a, a really full onboarding week, wh- which is the, the final ultimate test, basically, where they need to read a lot of uh, our um, values and how the company works, go through a lot of SOPs, uh, stuff like that. And uh, if they go through that well, you know, they stay. And a lot of the times what we do is also we hire two people for the same position mm-hmm. and then say that in the beginning, like, hey, there's a good chance that at the end of the month, one of you have, has to go. Um, but sometimes we keep both. Sometimes we have to find both uh, as well, right? It, it's really much like f- f- uh, hire slow, fire fast kind of thing. Wow. And I'm a little bit better in that as Neil because Neil is a little bit more emotional in that kind of sense than me. It's like we have a certain KPIs, of course, and we set them for each position before we start hiring. And if they just don't hit the KPIs, then yeah, I'm sorry, but you're not a fit. Yeah, absolutely. It's better to have uh, to cut that anchor free, definitely. Yeah, it definitely. sounds like uh, it sounds to me like the the journey and the lessons that you've learned like over these last few years have really set you up to run this thing at a at a massive level, which which is so exciting. I mean, you know, a lot of the times when we we talk about the entrepreneur journey, we talk uh, that instant success sometimes is uh, is amazing. So we have an idea and suddenly it comes to life, and well. Wow, you know, money's in the door and hey, things are going great. Other times, you know, that the idea fizzles out or whatever, but you've had, you know, that the success 
from the early days with the, the phone unlocking, you've had different projects that have gone really well. You've taken a big bite with, with Kaviyo and created a team and a culture around that. It's, it really feels to me like you've, you've, you said before about earning the money and versus deserving the money. Like it sounds like you've done the steps all the way along that have uh, really positioned you and Neil both extremely well for, for what's coming through the door. I think that's pretty exciting. I hope so. That's, that's the plan. Yeah. That's, that's exactly what we've been working for so hard. Like we don't want to uh, get caught in this, the launch model uh, of the internet marketing business, but really build an, a big, like, I mean, a really big ambitious uh, business. Uh, like I don't want to shoot for 10 million uh, recurring revenue a year. I want to shoot for 50 or a hundred million. Like if we ever going to get there, I don't know, but that's what I'm, I'm pushing and fighting for. And that's why um, like, that, that, I think that's one of the biggest strengths me and Neil have, right? Neil is way better at the short-term thinking. Yep. And he thinks about the money that we, we need right now. And without that money, without that thinking, that wouldn't be a long-term. Yes, and yes. I don't have that. I, I just, I don't know why, but I can't really see the short-term very much. Like if I would run a business on my, on my own, oh, it would burn in five, six months because I can't think in the short-term that, that well. But I think more the long term, like the year ahead or even two years or even five years ahead. And that's, that's where I want to be. Like um, the last two years, we kind of have been competing with click funnels, if you can call it competing. Like our product, I believe, is better. Um, not that much better, but better. Uh, but yeah, their marketing is way up there. <laughs> They're like, it's really hard to beat that, of course. And that's also one of the reasons that we decided with Kaiju 2, we, uh, we're doing this pivot away from a funnel builder, right? Like we're not, Russell Brunson owns the idea of funnels and, and, and his marketing and his authority is like, it's amazing. And we are moving away from that to become a customer journey builder platform. Right. Yeah, nice. And it's just kind of, you know, in my point of view, funnels, they are small uh, funnels, right? You know, you know, you do your funnel and generally if somebody goes through a funnel, it's, it's an hour, you know, that the, the time they take that. And one of the biggest problems we m noticed with our own funnels, uh, especially with, with Niels, like he has a different uh, info products, different software products. And all these funnels are go like this way, that way, that way, that way, that way, that way. There's no particular strat strategy behind all these funnels together. There's no particular direction to put all that together into, uh, into a business. Like that's the strategy of a business, right? And I think that was missing uh, for us with Kaivio or KV Social, the, the, the parent company kind of thing. And so I started thinking a lot about that. And that's kind of how I got to the customer journeys because well, that's what a customer journey is. It's basically chaining up different funnels and that can be sales funnels or just pure value based funnels. But that's what it is. You're chaining them all together to get that customer from point A to a, a point B, like uh, somewhere where they want to be. Like in, in, in a customer journey, there's two uh, models that are extremely important. So you have your, uh, your personal journey. Uh, there's different models, but I like the five stages of awareness where you're like problem unaware, problem aware, solutions aware, uh, product aware or solution aware, and then most aware. That's where somebody converts and either buying or uh, signing up for something, right? But if you do business to business like we are doing, you have a secondary model that's also really important and that's your business life cycle model. If you, if you target uh, one person with the five stages, great. Then you're one step ahead already. But you also have to think if you're selling towards a business is where is that business at? Right. Like if they're just a startup or if they're in maturity phase already, you have to talk to that business and you have to offer them different things as well. And that means different sales or micro funnels, whatever you want to call it. And that's where the customer journeys come in, right? So you have customer journey for uh, the first stage of a business model and a customer journey for the second stage, and they need to be linked so that those uh, people, uh, they, they will end up loving you because you grow with them and you always offer, uh, offer the exact thing they need at that moment for their business and for in whatever stage they're at uh, for the, whatever problem they're having uh, Very five cool. stages of awareness. Very cool. So that's, I, that's really our focus with uh, the new Kaiview. I'm excited to see it come, to, uh, come together, man. And, and again, congratulations to yourself and to Neil for, for bringing the company through the rocky start to the point where you're at now and uh, you know, under the guidance of you two and the leadership that you've shown um, you know, to get to the point where you are now, you've got 17 people on the team, obviously, and a whole bunch more people that are going to be impacted by, by the release. 
amazing story, man. Uh, thank you so much for sharing. I really appreciate it. Um, keep in touch with us. Let us know how you're going with launch plans and you know all that kind of stuff. I'm excited to see it coming through. We'll and again, definitely do that. Thank you for the for the chance to to bounce back and forth with you, man. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me, man. Like, and of course, uh, I'll hit you up with a, with a copy that you can just play around with it yourself. Nice. And uh, you know that will be cool. Awesome, man. Thank you so much. Steven Vanderpel, who is the CTO of Carvio, and of course, the wandering nomad or the digital <laughs> nomad who, ha who has lived in and worked in 50 or 60 different countries around the world. Mate, again, the journey is amazing. The lifestyle is incredible. But more than that, the focus and the dedication on the work and the end game is truly inspiring. So again, thank you for the time. I wish you all the best. And guys, make sure you check out Carvio and, and keep in touch with Steven and Neil as they're moving that forward. And uh, we look forward to keeping up with you guys as you hit the big, as you hit the big time. Thanks again, man. Thank you so much, man. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks.